को प्रेजेंटेड बाय जेके पंचर गार्ड टायर अब हवा नहीं निकलेगी को पावर्ड बाय डिश एच डी क्रिकेट कास्टली पार्टनर Good evening hello and welcome it's monday night start of a brand new week this is your prime time destination news news makers talking points the big talking point the indian rupee has hit an all time low we'll try and find out what its impact is going to be on the economy top economists will join us also the muslim population growth question surging or falling the national health survey debunks certain big myths we'll be talking on that too but first the nine headlines at 9 tonight weighed by global growth worries and an aggressive policy tightening from central banks across the world the rupee tumbles to a record low of 77.46 against the us dollar current account deficit is also in trouble the unrest in sri lanka now deepens one mp is killed as many as four ministers homes are set on fire as pro and anti government supporters clash on the street Sri Lanka's Prime Minister Rajapaksha resigns. High voltage drama in the capital Shaheen Bagh after bulldozers roll into anti CA stir epicenter locals hit the street in anger Supreme Court refuses to entertain a plea to stop the demolition. Center says it's willing to re-examine sedition laws home ministry tells the supreme court that the prime minister believes it's time to shed colonial baggage which includes outdated laws just two days ago the same government had said sedition was necessary MP Navneet Rana and her MLA husband reach Delhi couple hopes to meet home minister as they take their battle against the Uddhav government to the central government The Uddhav government wants the couple's bail to be cancelled over the Hanuman Chalisa face-off. After Maharashtra, the loudspeaker row now hits Karnataka. Chalisa chanted to counter Azan in the street. Sri Ram Sene activist slam Chief Minister Bomai for inaction against Moss. Congress leader and political rival Navjot Singh Sidhu meets Punjab Chief Minister to list issues in the state heaps praises on Bhagwant Maan sparking speculation is Sidhu reaching out to the Aam Aadmi Party now The biggest NIA crackdown on the Daud gang in Mumbai raids at 20 locations across the city allegedly targeted the gangsters real estate managers hawala operators and sharp shooters And Russia celebrates Victory Day as the war in Ukraine enters day 75 nukes tanks roll on the streets of Moscow in a show of strength as Vladimir Putin defends the invasion compares it to the second world war But the big breaking story that's coming in this evening Sri Lanka has now imposed a nationwide curfew deployed the army across Colombo this after pro government groups attacked protesters outside embattled Sri Lankan president Gotbaya Rajapaksha's office the situation in the island nation has turned tense after police fired tear gas to disperse the protesters remember the prime minister Mahinda Rajapaksha has resigned earlier today homes of four ministers have been set on fire by angry protesters one ruling party mp has been killed in clashes with anti government protesters so far 140 54 people have been injured in the clashes remember sri lanka is a country that's been on the boil amidst the collapsing economy and the street protests prime minister resigning earlier today So these are the visuals that are coming in there from Sri Lanka at the moment army deployed in Colombo amidst the unrest in uh, the Sri Lankan capital uh, homes of four MPs members of parliament have been torched a nationwide curfew now has been imposed in Sri Lanka those are the troubling images coming in from the island country So those are uh, uh, remember Sri Lanka has been a country which for now last 6 weeks has been in serious economic crisis joining me now is Rashika Jaikodi 
senior journalist who's been tracking those developments. Rashika, give us a sense of what's happening today. We've just heard uh, about more violence on the street, the homes of four MPs being set on fire. Has the situation returned to some kind of normalcy or are the streets still uh, boiling? The streets are still boiling and uh, street violence is, has, has erupted. And uh, a lot of, lot of, uh, lot of uh, young people, mobs are on the streets. And I think it all started when uh, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksha organized a meeting for his supporters at Temple Trees, his official residence, this morning. And the people who took part in that uh, meeting, they were emboldened by the pres president's, uh, Prime Minister's assurance that he would remain in office. And they started walking towards uh, the protesters who were just outside the Prime Minister's official residence. And they started attacking the protesters, and that's how it all started. And they burned down the, the tents that had been put up there. So uh, after that, a lot of people were angry at the uh, conduct of these people, the pro-government protesters, pro-government uh, uh, people who took part in that meeting. And they started uh, attacking them. They started attacking the buses. They, 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 they started, uh, you know, they, 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 they went after these people and stripped them naked and uh, violence was unleashed on them. Right. So it it so it, it it was it was incited. It was clearly incited and by is the this, prime minister. And is this just in Colombo or has the violence spread right across the country? At no, the violence has spread across the country, across the country in in in, in many districts across the island. Uh, especially uh, the houses of MPs uh, have come under attack, and their business establishments, business establishments owned by MPs, owned by politicians, ruling party politicians have come under attack, and also the houses of the people who organized the meeting this morning, it, they have also come under attack. Rashika, uh, so violence has. Uh, yeah. Rashika, you've got the prime minister who's resigned. Is there any possibility that even President Rajapaksha? may uh, offer to step down talk of some kind of an interim government being formed is there pressure on him also now to take some kind of decision the president's president's resignation is also inevitable i don't know whether he can he can hold on to his position for too long because violence has erupted and the prime minister has already resigned with the prime minister's resignation the cabinet stands dissolved so there's no proper government in the country right now uh, the the president is now forced to look at alternatives uh, I think the president's resignation is imminent. He has to resign, otherwise the violence will uh, exacerbate uh, and more people will come to the streets. So the president has to uh, I, you know, I'm, resign. I'm, right. And I'm seeing these dramatic pictures coming in from Colombo. Shocking visuals coming in of what's happening at the moment. The clashes that are taking place between the protesters. I appreciate you joining us uh, in these troubled times and giving us an update from our neighboring nation, which is clearly on the boil at the moment. Thanks very much for that update. From Sri Lanka, let's turn to India. Indian rupee hits all-time low against the dollar. Forex reserves below the $600 billion mark. Foreign funds pull out $21 billion from stock markets in seven months. Inflation surge forces rate hike. Economy red alert. Is India ready for the turbulence? That's right. If Sri Lanka is seeing political turbulence on the street in India, we could be seeing economic turbulence. The Indian rupee touched an all-time low of 77.47 paise against the US dollar today. The key factor driving the rupee lower was a surge in the US dollar globally following the US Federal Reserve's 50 basis point rate hike last week and its guidance for more hate rate hikes in the coming months. What exactly is the situation? Business Today's Sakshi Batra tries to decode and explain just why the economy is on the edge. Take a look. 
Well, that's right. The Indian rupee has slipped to its lowest level of 77.5 to the dollar. This is the first time that it has gone past the 77 per dollar mark. And one must remember that all this is a global issue and not just limited to India, as all Asian currencies have actually slipped against the dollar. Now, this is led by the yuan, the Chinese currency, which is at its lowest level since 2020, which is dragging down the other uh, currencies like the Thailand baht, the Philippines peso, South African rand, the A Indonesian rupee all of them are actually depreciating too and now this is because the US dollar is constantly rising higher US yields are actually pushing the US dollar uh, higher which is together creating a massive risk off in the riskier assets in emerging markets like India now a weaker rupee also eats into the FIS returns into the Indian assets thereby leading to higher FIR outflows from the Indian markets too which again leads to a fall in Indian markets and that is exerting pressure on the rupee as well the Indian rupee is also more vulnerable than the other currencies and that is due to higher crude oil prices as India is one of the highest importers of crude oil. Now we are already witnessing a widening of trade deficit to over $20 billion per month which also is again weighing on the rupee. Now how is a weaker rupee really impacting you and me? Now for the economy you must understand that the rupee devaluation means imports become dearer and inflation which is already a big problem may worsen from here. For companies that is the export-oriented companies and those businesses actually benefit like the IT or the pharma companies with a depreciating rupee while for importers they will actually need to shell out more money due to this weaker rupee on an individual level your purchasing power really reduces so in case you've been thinking of traveling abroad or studying abroad as well be prepared to shell out more on that too now the question is is this record low a new normal for the rupee now well for the short term yes because experts do believe that the rupee may further slip to 78 or even 79 levels so what does a falling rupee now mean for the indian economy indeed for global economies are forex reserves at a comfortable level as far as india is concerned is inflation going to become the biggest challenge that will further dampen spirits is india in a better position than others to face the turbulence that possibly lies ahead joining me now nilesh shah chairman CIA National Committee, MD Kotak Mahindra Asset Management and someone who's been part of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. Dr. Abhik Barwa is Chief Economist and Executive Vice President at HDFC Bank. Siddharth Sanyal is Chief Economist and Head Research at Bandhan Bank. And Siddharth Zarabi, Managing Editor, Business Today TV. Let me come to Nilesh Shah because just take a look at these hard numbers. The rupee reaches an all-time low of 77.41 against the dollar. India's foreign exchange reserves falling below the $600 billion mark. And you've got foreign institutional investors on a selling spree. April, the seventh month, consecutive month, where FIIs have been net sellers. Outflows, $3.8 billion. Inflation biting, real, uh, retail inflation around 7%. Should we be worried, very worried? It is all about how we see the numbers. Let me give your narrative in a different format. You, rupee has appreciated 13.5% against yen in last one year. Rupee has appreciated 9% against GBP last year. Rupee has appreciated similarly against euro. So rupee is actually on appreciation move. Second, while FX reserves have fallen, India is one of the few countries in the world where FX reserves are still higher than its FX debt. Mm -hmm. While inflation is high in India, it is one of that rare period in India's history where Indian inflation is lower than American inflation. Mm -hmm. And while growth is coming down in India, it is still for the second year in running, fastest growing major economy in the world. So it all depends upon how we want to see the economy. I, I, am, I, I, I as a journalist tend to see things as half empty. You as a person who uh, is a market analyst looks at it as half full. I'm just asking you, yes, we are doing better than other economies relative to the dollar. But should we be worried? I come back to the question. From your smile, I detect that you seem to be believe that we are in a comfortable position. Are we comfortable given the fact that we could have a further spike in oil prices, that this war in Ukraine could continue, that we have a lockdown in China, all of which could be affecting the world economy and we are no longer insulated from it? Undoubtedly, Rajdeep, we can't be complacent. 
as you very correctly mentioned we are in a very uncertain world where russia ukraine situation can pull oil prices higher in our kundli rahu and ketu is oil prices mm-hmm. a 10% rise in crude means 20 basis point drop in our gdp growth 40 basis point increase in our inflation so while we are better off compared to many other countries we can't afford to be complacent we need to be on our guard mm-hmm. we are seeing across our neighborhood how bad economic policies can create disaster pakistan mm-hmm. sri lanka mm-hmm. all are classic example of how bad economic policies can create disaster so we need to be concerned undoubtedly it's a very very challenging economic environment we are oasis among the desert but we still needs to be concerned okay you use the word oasis among the desert good word to take to uh, dr abig barwai are we really an oasis among in the desert or is it the fact that slowly even the de- even this oasis is facing a problem at the moment that could lead to further desertification uh yes uh, well, it depends on a couple of things on how you define uh, what you define as the desert what size the desert is uh my sense is that yes we are better placed than a lot of economies including a heavyweight economy that china uh there could be to use your word for the desertification we could the spirit of turbulence uh might persist for a while uh i mean this is rough weather this is likely to continue and i don't think we have a fix on how long it will continue mm-hmm. so we need to be prepared for uh, a, a lot of um, you know uncertainty turbulence in the markets mm-hmm. uh, impact uh, on inflation growth etc uh, for the uh, near term or even the medium term now when you say the near gr- term uh, uh, medium term uh, so uh, let me how, how, sort of define near yeah. term specifically so yes. three months medium term i would say 6 to 9 months the question is in, in this turbulence will the plane crash for other economies the plane might crash i am reasonably confident and i'm just sort of echoing what nilesh was saying that we are unlikely to crash this does not mean that we are entirely will be entirely protected from the mm. turbulence and i think inflation certainly is a big issue it is as you understand better than me a very major sort of political issue bringing it down is a huge challenge mm-hmm. there are challenges on the supply side on monetary policy and so forth and uh, you know that's the problem uh, that will sort of keep um, keep policy makers right. and politicians worried going forward siddharth sanyal will that also affect growth because you have an rbi report which says the indian economy may take 12 years to recoup pandemic losses estimating output losses during the pandemic period at around 52 lakh crores now you've got high inflation you've got global risks uh, that seem to be only deepening by the day will this all affect growth even more substantially than feared initially just a month ago uh, undoubtedly the near term recovery will will uh, will face some additional headwinds mm-hmm. at this moment there has been very significant impact on disposable income in hand especially in the uh, for the lower end of the uh, socio economic pyramid and uh, what we have seen uh, in case of india uh, private consumption driven uh, recovery was was what was what was expected mm-hmm. over the course of the last few months now what is happening at this moment is is that uh the the consumer confidence index which was recovering somewhat uh the last reading was uh, uh, has been in the early covid days level after after a significant recovery from its uh, from its lows from its lows actually the numbers are about 40% higher Mm-hmm. but whether this recovery will continue will depend very significantly uh, on on how the disposable income over the course of the next few months pan out right uh, in the month of april we have seen some some uh, indication that people might go a little slow in terms of credit demand uh, on 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 ground again i would agree completely with what nilesh ji and and uh, abik Abh- Abh- mentioned uh, very clearly that we are possibly in a much better position uh, compared to uh, compared to many other, many other peers mm-hmm. but 
at this moment, there has been a significant impact over the course of the last about a month, month and a half. Right. You know, Siddharth Zarabi, you track North Block, you speak to people in the finance ministry. How worried are they? You know, this was po there was a sense that post-COVID, Indian e economy was on this road to reco uh, recovery. Then comes the Ukraine war, uh, oil prices rising. You've got inflation surging across the world. There are supply constraints. China heading for another lockdown in Shanghai. Is there a worry or not in North Block? Or is the attitude, don't worry, be happy? And just show and tell the world, look, we are better off than the rest. So don't worry. Well, uh, I, I, I won't say that is the attitude. I think the attitude also is that uh, we have seen perhaps worse. And I remember not in the recent context, but some time ago, asking a senior official and he said, what's new in that? We've been on a roller coaster for uh, quite a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, Rajdeep, the, no one knew on the 1st of February what would happen on the 1st of April or 1st of May. And like speakers, economists before me have said that we are now in a period of high uncertainty, I would say extreme uncertainty for certain reasons. The current latest spark or straw on the camel's back is an external uh, development on which we have had very little control, which is Russia and what is happening in Ukraine. China's continuing COVID uh, struggles and draconian lockdowns are having their own impact. So, and the I Fed rate out. hikes, and the Fed rate hikes, which are which is again like <laughs> we are likely to see possibly a few more hikes, which is again a cause of concern. Uh, well, uh, I wouldn't call a Fed rate hike a cause of concern. It is something that the RBI preempted 24 hours uh, earlier, and I compliment the RBI for doing that. I just want to make one clear point: the impetus and responsibility on the central government and our states to once again be prepared to uh, support the economy has now become far more important. And just one last point, Rajdeep, mm -hmm. please take note, and I keep saying it on your show, today is the 34th or 35th day that petrol and diesel prices, the daily changes have been stopped. So the government of India is taking one step to somehow control this imported oil-led inflation. It has an impact on oil company balance sheets, mm -hmm. but taxes are not being cut by the center and state. So I think that is the biggest and most crucial issue on which we need to see action. And hopefully, uh, we might get right. to hear something on that in the days ahead. But as I, we are just putting up a graphic showing food inflation, which is also steeply climbing or slowly, certainly climbing, and that should be a worry. Fuel, fuel inflation remains a concern as long as the war remains in Ukraine because we are hostage in a way to global uh, oil price hikes. But Nilesh Shah, given that uncertainty, the last thing businessmen want is uncertainty. We are seeing the stock markets. You follow the markets very closely. We are seeing foreign institutional investors have been pulling out for the last six months. There are concerns at the moment. The LIC IPO... Uh, is basically being driven by domestic investors, it appears, rather than any foreign investors. Is that a concern that even markets could take a hit in the near term? So undoubtedly, stock markets will be choppy in the near term. With so much uncertainty on Russia, Ukraine, oil, US Fed rate, and India inflation, mm -hmm. it is unlikely that stock markets will become anchored. They will be volatile. Mm -hmm. But we have to remember that over the last decade or so, India has delivered more return than its peers like Brazil, like South Africa, like China, mm -hmm. like Indonesia, like Turkey, like Mexico. Our equity valuations are today at nearly all-time high vis-a-vis -vis our peer group, nearly all-time high. Mm -hmm. And Indian local investors are there in the market to buy. If FPIs today want to book profit, India is the best country because they can sell without creating much price impact. So stock markets will be volatile in the near term. Mm -hmm. uh, you're saying that stock markets will be volatile in the near term. The key factor though, uh, uh, Abhik Barua, is inflation. You know, there is, as Siddharth says, the government seems conscious of the fact that you've got to rein in fuel inflation at the moment. They haven't hiked duties in the last... 30 days, but 
the concern is that the situation may well go out of hand. We've seen, for example, ATA prices only because wheat production is down at the moment. Uh, right. and, and you've got food prices rising all the time. You've got uh, summer vegetable prices, other prices, tomato, all rising at the moment, at least in the short term. Is that the biggest challenge? To get inflation under control is India's biggest challenge over the next six to eight weeks? Uh, at this moment, yes. Uh, and I think um, inflation certainly is much higher than we had anticipated. And this is largely because of external factors, even, even sort of food prices like ATA prices have uh, moved up because there are pressures on the international global wheat markets because Ukraine and Russia are big producers of wheat. So if the problem is not internal, it's that much more difficult to handle. And you need a combination bo of both fiscal measures, which sort of the, the tax cut that Siddharth referred to uh, really is, and uh, you know monetary measures at the same time because there's a quick sort of feed through mm -hmm. to uh, other products it's a, it's a inflation is a sort of a contagious thing if coal prices move up for instance your neighborhood uh, you know press wala wines your clothes mm -hmm. starts charging you more for uh, uh, for his services so it's, it's it's it just sort of uh, percolates through the system very quickly so both these things the initial uh, drivers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which are largely global in nature, mm -hmm. will have to be handled. And the dispersion of inflation um, across uh, different items and services, mm -hmm. uh, which are sort of more domestic, uh, would also need to be tackled. Uh, so I think the international drivers would have to be tackled largely through, you know, a whole, whole bunch of things apart from, you know, cutting taxes. I think our Diplomacy, for instance, is has been very um, nimble in ensuring that we still sort of are able to buy oil from uh, in Russia, for instance. I, I thought that was a mm -hmm. very, very clever diplomatic move. So you need a combination of these things to um, you know get get your uh, get your formula right. Siddharth Sanyal, final word for you. Also, inflation the biggest challenge in the near term. Yes, because the pressures are coming at this moment from multiple fronts. Uh, if you if you see, uh, uh, we all discuss a lot about oil prices, but also uh, food prices, which is also quite global in nature, the, has, has been a point of worry. What we don't discuss uh, adequately, possibly, uh, over the last maybe two, three years, and that, that particular phenomena continues and which is beyond the control of anyone, the small patches of weather disruptions in India has actually increased very significantly over the course of the last couple of years and causes right. near-term food uh, food price spikes. Uh, also, metal prices remain high. Overall, producer price, which is me measured by WPI, mm -hmm. remains very, very high. So near-term, it's very clear, uh, clear that the focus has to be in, uh, in, in containing inflation. Otherwise, as you uh, mentioned earlier, we'll have a significant uh, impact on near-term growth recovery. Let's leave it there. Clearly, inflation remains a big concern. The falling rupee, of course, uh, is the immediate news spec that we had today. There are global factors out there. Are we in a better position? Most of the panelists seem to believe we are compared to the rest of the world. But given the fact that we've just come out of COVID and now we are facing the fallout of the war in Ukraine, India is a country where the economy must be the top focus. The red alert must be on the economy. Treat the rest as weapons of mass distraction, as I call it. Thank you all very much for joining me. Now, one of those mass distractions is the bulldozer, because the bulldozer has now come into Delhi Shaheen Bagh, that, remember, was the epicenter of the anti-CA protests in 2019. A demolition drive by the civic authorities today triggered high-voltage politics. The Ahmadmi Party and the Congress are accusing the BJP of trying to use the bulldozer to score points ahead of the municipal elections later this year. The big question, of course, will this battle be settled on the street or in the courts? Take a look at our top political story. A new showdown in the national capital. This time, the hulking JCB rumbled through what was once the epicenter of anti-CAA protests. 
after a two and a half hours hula balu, the only structure that came down was the iron rods that were put over here for the renovation work. Interestingly, this also wasn't a job of the bulldozer, but the locals who agreed to themselves removed these construction work that was put outside this factory outlet. The bulldozer, the moment after that, took a U-turn and left Shaheen Bagh. Traffic blocked, riot police ringed around. Authorities called it a routine anti-encroachment drive. The bulldozer is not a bulldozer, the bulldozer is not a bulldozer. जो लोग आज उन्होंने गलती मानी जो लोगों ने माना है कि हमसे गलती हुई और हम दोबारा से जो अतिक्रमण बचा है उसको हटाने का काम करेंगे अगर वो नहीं हटाएंगे तो पूरा रोड साइड जितना अतिक्रमण है या अंदर कॉलोनी में अतिक्रमण है उस सब को हम खाली कराने का काम करेंगे बट द बुलडोजर एट शाहीन बाग डिड बिल्ड अप अ मेजर फेस ऑफ बिटवीन द आम आदमी पार्टी एंड द बीजेपी मैं तीन दिन पहले आया था मैंने खुद आह्वान किया लोगों से लोगों ने इंक्रोचमेंट को हटा लिया अब ये मुझे बता दे इंक्रोचमेंट है कहा अगर इंक्रोचमेंट है मैं खुद तोड़वा लूंगा मैंने खुद तोड़वाया है ये पीडब्ल्यू का रोड है अगर ये गलत करेंगे तो लोग तो आएंगे ना मुझे मेरे से बात करें इनसे के लोग यहाँ लोकल पुलिस भी है आए वो शाहीन बाग ग्रैब्ड इंटरनेशनल हेडलाइंस इन दिसंबर 2019 आफ्टर हंड्रेड्स ऑफ डेमोन्स्ट्रेटर्स मोस्टली वुमेन ऑक्यूपाइड वन ऑफ इट्स बस्लिंग स्ट्रीट्स टू प्रोटेस्ट द सिटीजनशिप अमेंडमेंट एक्ट थ्री मंथ डेमोन्स्ट्रेशन एंडेड आफ्टर द पैंडमिक लॉकडाउन सेट इन लोकल रेजिडेंट्स इन द मुस्लिम डोमिनेटेड नेबरहुड अलेज वेंडेटा बिहाइंड द बुलडोजर एक्शन बुलडोजर ड्राइव है बुलडोजर ड्राइव पर्टिकुलरली एक कम्युनिटी के खिलाफ भाजपा सरकार दिमाग पे बुलडोजर चलाना चाह रही है हमारे घरों पे मस्जिदों पे नहीं बल्कि दिमाग पे द ड्राइव इन द साउथ दिल्ली नेबरहुड केम इन द वेक ऑफ बुलडोजर प्लाउंग इन टू सेवरल स्ट्रक्चर एट जहांगीरपुरी इन नॉर्थ वेस्ट डेली टू वीक्स अगो ostensibly as a part of an anti encroachment measure that followed communal clashes in that area the political rhetoric remains the same jo log atikraman ko bachane ke liye jo bangladeshi rohingyaon ke atikraman ko bachane ke liye aatank phailane wale logon ko atikraman bachane ke liye jo bulldozer ke samne lete hain janta bhi unko letane wali hai an earth mover or a dog whistle in an increasingly surcharged political climate designed to remove illegal constructions the bulldozer however today has been branded a political tool leading to a face off between the aam aadmi party led delhi government and the bjp led municipal corporation but with no big construction demolished today in shaheen bag was it a warning against those who may take law and order into their own hand or was it a sheer political messaging in delhi with himanshu puja shali for india today now from the bulldozer which seems to have stirred a communal divide on the ground let's turn to an issue which has over the years also stirred a communal divide of sorts population growth rates now the myth which has been spread by some is that muslims could overtake hindus at present population growth rates because according to this myth muslims are procreating much faster well the fifth national family health survey has shown that across all communities fertility rates are following and falling and in fact muslim community fertility rates are actually declining even more sharply over the last two decades showing clearly that education is the real factor in fact the real significant difference at the moment is no longer hindu versus muslims as is often believed but north india versus south india in a moment we'll tell you more but first look at this story from milan sharma the fifth national family survey has debunked many population myths the country's overall fertility rate has dipped to 2 which is lower than the population replacement level of 2.1 Now only 5 states in India are above the replacement level of 2.1. They are Bihar, Meghalaya, Uttar Pradesh, Jharkhand and Manipur. Among the religious communities, the Muslim fertility rate saw the sharpest fall. 
from 4.4 in 1992 to 93 to 2.3 in 2019 to 2021 yet the muslim community fertility rate remains the highest among all fertility rate among hindus dropped to 1.94 from 2.1 in 2015 to 16 the figure in 1992 to 93 was 3.3 The Buddhist and new Buddhist community had the lowest fertility at 1.39. Muslims have also increasingly adopted modern spacing methods of contraception from 17% in National Family Health Survey 4 to 25.5 in National Family Health Survey 5, which is the third highest after Sikhs 27.3% and Jains 26.3%. With Milan Sharma in New Delhi, Bureau Report India today. So let's raise the questions and debunk a few myths. Muslim population growth is it rising or falling as the survey shows? Is the real issue the north south divide? What are the takeaways from this health survey? Joining me now is Poonam Muthreja from uh, the Population Council and I'm also joined by Dr. SY Qureshi, uh, popul- uh, uh, author the Population Myth Islam Family Planning and Politics in India. He's also former chief election commissioner let's go first to poonam mutreja po- sorry uh, uh, let's go first to dr kureshi dr kureshi you've been talking about busting the myths and one of those myths you've been saying is that muslim populations are no longer rising as sharply as most people believe they are coming down when you look at the numbers they are still higher than hindus 1.94 versus 2.3 so which figure do we look at do we look at absolute figures 2.3 versus 1.94 or the fact that over the last two decades muslim population growth rates have declined even more sharply than any other community yeah rajdeep the second second is important it is true that the muslim population um, uh, growth is the highest still uh, their family planning is the least still but having conceded that the the fact that in the last 20 years the uh, they are catching up very fast their uh, the, Uh, the rate of growth is declining faster than the hindus as a result mm-hmm. the gap between the hindus and muslims which was uh, 1.1% 30 years ago uh, for, uh, and and fhs4 came down to um, uh, 0.48 and now it has come down to 0.36 mm-hmm. so it is coming down and the reason why the uh, muslims they still have the least family planning is because the uh, socio economic factors which determine the determine the family planning behavior namely literacy particularly of girls income and service delivery these are most crucial and in all three muslims are the most backward and nobody is talking about their education nobody is talking of their poverty mm. on the contrary every other day we get a video uh, where congregations are being uh, the, uh, asked to boycott uh, the muslims economically so they will become poorer and then they will uh, produce children then uh, yeah, you no, but, like but, it but but then but so the survey it, the survey by dr qureshi clearly shows that if i look at 20 years or a 30 year span from 1991 when growth rates among fertility rates were 4.4% to today 2.3 that's a huge decline so clearly exactly. something has happened in the last 30 years as it has happened across communities what yes. according to you has happened because the propaganda is that muslims are continuing to have more than 3 children 4 children 5 children this survey says 2.34 they could even reach at this rate replacement levels 10 years from now at 2.1 yeah you know the propaganda has been and the impression created very widely is that the gap between hindus and muslims is 8 9 10 children whereas uh, nfhs for five surveys tell us that the gap was never more than 1.1 children 1.1 only and that also has come down to half the child and now one third 0.36 the fact which is why the which is the, because muslims are catching up on family planning faster despite their illiteracy despite their poverty and despite the fact that services uh, the do not reach there those so called muslim pocket which they call derisively as mini pakistan they don't go there so despite that muslims are catching up very fast which is a very good thing very good sign and you know important and driven and driven by what muslims driven by what dr qureshi in your view why what explains that yeah you know because uh, 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 20 25 years ago the india realized that development is the best contraceptive 
and the, you know the focus on education and literacy overall for the country the fact that country is developing which is why family planning is happening and all through persuasion mind you no danda no the, the compulsory family planning has happened in 75 77 from the backlash of which we have not recovered till today is in it? fact interestingly i did a study i was the chairman of a committee mm -hmm. we wanted to study the political politicians attitude towards family planning mm -hmm. and we found they are not bothered they are scared of talking of family planning and we had examined four lok sabha 13 14 15 okay, 16 I'll, 20 years i'll let, let me just lacks of question parliamentary questions only 0.15% were questions on family planning let so me, let, me just, that, take, let uh, me just take let me just take population uh, policy Dr. i just want to such a success yeah. I, I just want to stop you for a moment because dr punam mutreja is joining me and her video was going in and out uh, dr mutreja what is your biggest take away from this survey because the focus in this country has always been at least politically on the religious divide but what i see from the survey is the real story is the north south divide south india reaching replacement levels and it's the north indian states which remain backward so instead of hindu muslim as our politicians seem to focus on should we really be focusing on north versus south absolutely north versus south in fact the muslim population in tamil nadu has much lower fertility rates than the uh, hindu population in bihar so that's a stark example of what you're saying and we should in fact there are five states in the north that we need to focus on mm -hmm. and we need to focus on um, the indicators which kureshi saab also mentioned education services better health governance and and uh, creating jobs and livelihoods for people who do not have access to um, family planning are the lowest quintile they are the scheduled caste scheduled tribe women the mm -hmm. muslims and so on and second we need to give more choice uh um as indonesia and bangladesh have done where both uh, where the muslim population has seen big fertility decline north is an area where it is the indicators that dictate uh, whether you're a hindu or a muslim where fertility is declining slowly but it is declining and amongst the muslim population of north india too mm -hmm. not only south india yeah, but, 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 but uh, let me uh, let uh, me uh, just uh, reiterate uh, let me just reiterate dr mutreja something you said for our viewers you are telling me that muslim hmm. population fertility rates in tamil nadu are declining more sharply than hindu fertility rates in uttar pradesh and bihar absolutely, so the real absolutely. the real crisis still rise within the bimaru states mainly bihar up also jharkhand absolutely. much more absolutely. than they do uh, in in terms of hindu muslims am i correct so there is a absolutely. direct linkage between access to education women's education and fertility rates rather than As religion as well as health to uh, access to health. health services you know religion has very little to do today with fertility rates so so the south kerala lakshadweep uh, look at tamil nadu in fact you know the tfr for hindus is 2.29 in up mm -hmm. and for muslims it's less than 2 in tamil nadu mm -hmm. you know I, i i have some figures which says that at present growth rate because the the propaganda was that at present growth rates muslims would overwhelm hindus well this if these rates remain in 2070 there would be uh, 27 uh, 277 uh, muslim share of population would be about you know 0.21 on mean, sorry let me get that right growth rate at present growth rates hindu population in 2070 would be 277 crores hindus and 58 crores muslims so you would still have virtually the same ratio as it is today absolutely and they can never overtake the hindu population and secondly in the last two decades rajdeep the muslim population has declined faster than the hindu population across the country but it's still higher than hindu population so there are those who will turn around and say look it's still 2.3 versus 1.94 
Yeah. So, but it will equalize, it. will invest in their education. You know, education levels have increased amongst Muslims. And to quote from Qureshi Saab's book, there is a growing middle class which recognizes right. that they want to have fewer children. And by the way, the unwanted fertility of Muslims is close to 13, uh, uh, 11%, while for Hindus, it's 9%, which means that 2% um, we can decrease further as the women do want to have fewer children. The Muslim wanted fertility rate is much lower um, than uh, the um, um, uh, fertility rate. Right. So, so I, we can invest more. They they use uh, temporary methods more. And India has focused primarily on sterilization. So if you, in fact, it is an opportunity to provide Muslim women temporary methods. India has much fewer methods than Indonesia, Bangladesh, and all our so instead of say, you know playing politics on this, we need to invest in uh, family planning, but also education. And Bo jobs. bottom line, bottom line, the real correlation is between health and education. The more yes. access you provide to health services, education, the better. I'll give you thirty seconds, Doctor Kureshi, very quickly. Yeah, two two quick points. You know, I got a math my mathematical model prepared by Professor Dinesh Singh and Professor Ajay Kumar. To, to know how soon Muslims will overtake the Hindu. And the model says never, in, not for 1,000 years. And uh, one fact which is very important that in 1951, the gap between Hindus and Muslims was 27 crores more Hindus. Now there are 80 crore more Hindus and growing because 42% of the Hindus are not practicing family planning. Imagine 42% of 80% population not practicing family right. planning. They are not far behind uh, the, in the lack of family exactly. planning. Uh, can I give one more yes. statistic? Uh, and that is that uh, it is 36 percent uh, Muslims, uh, Hindus believe uh, it is the responsibility of women to do family planning. And compared to that, it is 30, uh, it is 32 percent Muslims. So more Muslim be men believe it is not a woman's responsibility only. OK. Let's leave it there. This is our that fascinating, is the and these are data. fascinating facts that have come from this National Family Health Survey. We need yes. much more data like this to bust the myths. It's time to bust myths in this country. That's one way, in a way, to reduce the friction that exists between communities. Dr. Kureshi Poonam Mutreja, thank you very much for joining me here on the news today. Let's take a break. On the other side, well, it's Vladimir Putin's day out as he is celebrating May 9th. We'll tell you why in a moment from now. Why are the Russians on the streets? Back in a moment. You're watching the news today. News without the noise. Make your media plan smarter with India Today Live TV on your connected devices. Amplify your brand with 100 million smart internet viewers. To advertise, mail us at sales at arjtag.com or call And if you do, then how were you introduced to it? Was it a friend, a co-worker who introduced it to you? You certainly must have not found it on the shelves. Well, this is because their products are primarily distributed through a network of maybe 4 million members in over 100 countries. The beauty and wellness products company, Amway, is now under fire by the Enforcement Directorate for running a pyramid scheme. ED has also added that Amway's purpose is not to sell its exorbitantly priced products, but instead to induce the public to sign up as members of its get-rich schemes. And this led to ED attaching assets of Amway India Enterprises Private Limited worth over 757.7 crores following a money laundering probe under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, the PMLA. Is Amway a pyramid scheme? 
Well, pyramid schemes might look like they are built around legitimate products, but the goal really is usually just to get as many people enrolled as possible. The scheme participants go to extreme lengths to recruit new members, taking persistence and pressure to uncomfortable levels. The point of the scheme is really never about selling the products, it's simply about enrolling increasing number of people, all of whom are required to buy products. They make money based on recruiting an ever-increasing number of investors. The initial promoters recruit investors who in turn recruit more investors and so on goes the cycle. The scheme is called a pyramid scheme because at each level the number of investors only increases. Many people have alleged that Amway runs a similar program that only benefits a select few people at the top. And now with the ED action, it seems there's more credence to these allegations. Amway's response? Amway has said that the Enforcement Directorate's action is regarding an investigation that dates back to 2011 and since then the company has been cooperating with the agency. The company's spokesperson has also added that Amway has a rich history of maintaining the highest levels of property, integrity, corporate governance and consumer protection which are much ahead of time in the interest of the consumers at large. Welcome back. Uh, let's turn to our final story of the day and it comes from Moscow where uh, Russia celebrates its 77th year of victory over Nazi Germany. Military tanks, armored vehicles, missile launchers, thousands of personnel parading on the streets of Moscow. Russia's military might was full on display with the unfinished war in Ukraine overshadowing the celebrations. We leave you with those images tonight and just a small reminder that on that day when Russia celebrated its victory over Nazi Germany, Ukraine and Russia were on the same side. So Victory Day is actually also celebrated in Ukraine. To think then that these two countries are at war with each other. It's unfortunate, it's tragic, and these images really hide what is the reality of the times in which we live. Military might alone cannot solve the world's problems. Think about it. We do not need war, we need peace. That should be the message. Thanks for watching. You stay well, stay safe. Good night, Shubhratri. Jai Hind. Namaskar. констатувати, що російські війська розпочали битву за Донбас, до якої давно готувались. The battle of Donbas begins with a new offensive pushed by Russia along Ukraine's eastern flank. Ukraine's army has been bracing for this renewed assault since the Kremlin devised its new strategy to focus on an assault in the Ukrainian region of Donbas. But why Donbas? Donetsk and Luhansk Ukraine's two big eastern regions make up Donbas, and Kremlin identifies the region as a Russian-speaking part of Ukraine. Most of Donetsk and Luhansk are currently under the separatist regime, and what was left has gradually been brought into the fold in this war. Russia claimed that 54% of Donetsk and 93% of Luhansk are under their control. So once Putin has complete control over it, 
these two regions will amount to a large victory. And after victory, Putin's next move would be to annex Donbass just like Crimea in 2014. The victory over these two regions would be a symbolic win for Kremlin as Donbass has a population that speaks Russian and a win would fit into Kremlin's narrative, which is saving these territories from Ukrainian nationalism. Donbass proximity to Russia also makes it a region of contradiction, especially since both pro-Russian sentiments are the strongest thanks to Donetsk People's Republic and the Lohansk People's Republic, officially recognized by Putin ahead of his invasion. President Putin even signed a presidential decree allowing residents of LPR and DPR to receive Russian citizenship under a simplified procedure, citing international human rights legislation. Around the same time, Ukraine passed a language law to de-Russianize the country, including parts of Ukraine-controlled Donbass. Putin's claim to save Russians living in Ukraine from this kind of erasure could also be a major push for his plan. For eight years, this region has seen major conflict and onslaught from the Ukrainians as well since they were the breakaway territories, homes shelled and border towns living in fear of being attacked. The people in these parts demanded autonomy, even if not independence. And negotiations struck when the Minsk agreements came into being, which bought the region some peace till the recent invasion started. Russia needs the Donbass region today as a buffer. But Moscow's move to capture territories beyond Donbass and the destruction and damage it has caused to a sovereign nation is indicative of future plans of Russia to encircle and secure any and all territories that could pose a threat to its own borders, albeit a complete violation of international rules and norms. watching India Today.